Hello friends and neighbors, welcome to 2015. My New Year's resolution for 2015 is to actually finish the things that I have started, whether it be books or stories I'm writing or video reviewing series. And so yes, it's time to get back to the favorite book series, and specifically it's time to get back to the series of reviews on the Incarnations of Immortality series by Piers Anthony. So continuing on, we're looking at book two, Bearing an Hourglass. Just as On a Pale Horse looked at the incarnation of death as inhabited by the mortal named Zane, Bearing an Hourglass looks at the incarnation of time inhabited by a mortal named Norton, who takes up the job shortly after having his heart broken by the woman he fell in love with, Orlean. Now this is the incarnation of time, and if you know anything about me and my preference in stories, you know that I love time travel and stories about time. I'm fascinated by the concept, I'm fascinated by stories that move back and forth through time. My favorite book is The Time Traveler's Wife, my favorite movie is Back to the Future. I just love time travel. And the incarnation of time, the protagonist of this story, is not only somebody who can travel back and forth through time and bend time to his will, but he also lives backwards. I mean, all of those are fascinating ideas, and this is a book that should hold endless interest and fascination to me. This book bored the ever-loving snot out of me. Even as a kid, this was my least favorite book in the series. 1, 6, and 7 were my favorites. I liked 3 and 5. 4 was alright, and 2 I basically read because it was part of the series and I felt like I had to. Now, this is not an uncommon affliction with series of stories, whether it be a book series, a movie series, or a television series. The second installment of that series usually suffers in some way. I call it second book syndrome. Either the first installment of the story was so good and set expectations so high that the second installment of the story can't hope to match them, or or, after achieving success with the first part of the series, the author doesn't feel the need to really try as hard with the second part of the series. And I will admit that my high expectations from On a Pale Horse did factor a little bit into my opinion of Bearing an Hourglass. On a Pale Horse used the personification and the incarnation of death to give us a really multifaceted and in-depth look at the topic of death itself. Because we're looking at it from the point of view of the person whose business is death and dying, we're getting to look at it in a way that maybe we hadn't considered before. Now, early on, Anthony stated that his intention for the series was to make it a five-book series with one book focusing on each of the major incarnations that we meet, the incarnations of death, time, fate, war, and nature. And so my expectation was that this book would be a very idea-driven book like the first one was, looking at time from a many-faceted point of view, like many time travel stories do. So I was expecting an exploration on the nature of time, the perceived passage of time, the nature of cause and effect, and all of those wonderful little things that we get to look at when we look at time and time travel. Unfortunately, the only thing that Anthony really explored in depth was the nature of the hourglass that time uses as his major tool for time travel, and those were just unspeakably boring. There was also the fact that time, or Kronos, lived backwards, an idea that Anthony explained so often and so emphatically that it really left nothing to the imagination and it just took up so many pages of the story that could have been taken up with something more interesting. In short, rather than exploring time from a interesting and philosophical perspective, Anthony just explains and explains and explains and my god, shut up already, explains the technical nitpicky aspects of how time works in this specific universe. So it's not an idea-driven story and in lieu of that, I would have accepted a character-driven story. I'll always accept a character-driven story. But if Anthony these books have one fault, and they don't, they have several, but if they have one fault, it is characterization. Anthony basically has one male protagonist and one female protagonist that he writes about constantly. Yes, he'll change little personality quirks and maybe even their appearance, kind of, but that's all they are, just quirks. It's essentially the same personality every single time. And the character of Norton is no different. He's bland and he's boring and he's just utterly forgettable. Yes, he has a tragic romance at the beginning of the book, but honestly, it would have made a good book on its own, but it really doesn't factor into this story, and the result is that by the end of the book, it's basically just glanced over. It's a little side story that really doesn't go anywhere. None of the characters left any kind of impression on me. Even the Office of Time itself isn't all that interesting. The first book gave us quite a bit of detail on the incarnation of death and what the office did and why it needed to exist, but after reading this book at least two times, I honestly couldn't tell you why the incarnation of time needs to exist, or what exactly the incarnation does, either than live backwards, float back and forth through time, and occasionally sleep with the incarnation of fate. So finally, given what an interesting story Anthony set up in the first novel with the battle between God and Satan and all that sort of thing, 
I was expecting this to at least be a plot-driven novel. Add to that the fact that this novel takes place 20 years after the end of the first novel, and according to the first novel, something really, really important is supposed to happen 20 years after the events of the first novel, and so I thought, okay, this is good, we're going to see something really interesting happen, we're going to really move this plot forward. But even though I know that Norton defeated Satan and eventually won the day, I honestly couldn't tell you what he accomplished. Because essentially, there really is no plot. Nothing really happens. There are a bunch of little subplots here and there, but there's no main plot. There are whole chapters in this book, chapters plural, that are nothing more than just distraction and offer little, if anything, to the overall story. Seriously, when I was rereading this book, I actually skipped two whole chapters. Two chapters, and it didn't make one bit of difference in my overall perception of what was going on in the story. None. And overall, the story in this book offers little, if any, connection to the overall story of the series. You could skip this book entirely and not lose anything in the story that Anthony is trying to tell. I feel like this is the book that Pierce Anthony felt obligated to write because he said he was going to focus on all of the incarnations, but he really didn't know what to do with it. This really illustrates to me that Piers Anthony's strength is in fantasy, not science fiction. The science fiction elements in this story, and there are quite a few, are either poorly explained or over-explained, and in many cases, both. There's absolutely nothing driving this book forward. Not ideas, not characters, not even plot. I'm willing to admit that my expectations were set pretty high by On a Pale Horse, but at the end, this book represents Piers Anthony at his worst. All of his flaws are laid bare right here. It's plotting, it's uninteresting, it's badly characterized. It's just a bad book all around, and on the worth meter, this book gets a worthless. And it can only get better from here. So book three in the series is with a tangled skein looking at the incarnation of fate. See you then. And now my puppy has come to join me. Hello, Shadow. Say hi to everybody, Shadow. Say hi! You don't want to be up here right now, do you? Okay.